There you go, Father. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. So today I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some really strange things in the reflection on the scripture that we're going to be reading in just a bit. First, let's begin with our prayer and get going. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Great. And since it's Wednesday, we're going to keep praying with our St. Joseph prayer in this year of St. Joseph. To you, O blessed Joseph, do we come in our tribulation, and having implored the help of your most holy spouse, we confidently invoke your patronage also. Through that charity which bound you to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, and through the paternal love with which you embraced the child Jesus, we humbly beg you graciously to regard the inheritance which Jesus Christ has purchased by his blood, and with your power and strength to aid us in our necessities. O most watchful guardian of the Holy Family, defend the chosen children of Jesus Christ. O most loving Father, ward off from us every contagion of error and corrupting influence. O our most mighty protector, be kind to us and from heaven assist us in our struggle with the power of darkness. As once you rescued the child Jesus from deadly peril, so now protect God's holy church from the snares of the enemy and from all adversity. Shield too each one of us by your constant protection, so that supported by your example and your aid, we may be able to live piously, to die in holiness, and to obtain eternal happiness in heaven. Amen. Great. Super. Let's dig in so I can get to the weird things I want to say today. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, whom, taught by the Holy Spirit, we dare to call our Father, bring, we pray, to perfection in our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters, that we may merit to enter into the inheritance which you have promised. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, the highland of Pisgah, which faces Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead and as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea, the Negev, the circuit of the Jordan with the lowlands at Jericho, city of Palms, and as far as Zoar. The Lord then said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I would give to their descendants. I have let you feast your eyes upon it, but you shall never cross over. So there in the land of Moab, Moses, the servant of the Lord died as the Lord had said, and he was buried in the ravine opposite Beth Peor in the land of Moab. But to this day, no one knows the land or the place of his burial. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were undimmed and his vigor unabated. For 30 days, the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab, 
till they had completed the period of grief and mourning for Moses. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, since Moses had laid his hands upon him. And so the children of Israel gave him their obedience, thus carrying out the Lord's command to Moses. Since then, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He had no equal in all the signs and wonders. The Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and against all his land. And for the might and the terrifying power that Moses exhibited in the sight of all Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Responsorial. Blessed be God who filled my soul with fire. Blessed be God who filled my soul with fire. <laughs> Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing praise to the glory of his name. Proclaim his glorious praise. Say to God, how tremendous are your deeds. Blessed be God who filled my soul with fire. Come and see the works of God, his tremendous deeds among the children of Adam. Bless our God, you peoples. Loudly sound his praise. Blessed be God who filled my soul with fire. Hear now. All you who fear God, while I declare what he has done for me. When I appealed to him in words, praise was on the tip of my tongue. Blessed be God, who filled my soul with fire. Alleluia, alleluia. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right. <clears throat> there are three things. And there with the book. There are three things that I want to discuss real fast, very, very quickly. First of all, the gospel, which is now, it fell over. Uh, the gospel is this passage that we hear every year uh, several times. Very useful little piece of advice, but not in the instrumental way. Don't necessarily take this as this is how you treat with each other when you have disagreements. There may be more uh, promising or at least prudent ways of doing that, Rather, the point is kind of at the end of the pericope, it's about agreement, it's about coherence and how beneficial this is. And not just because prayer is more effective that way, but rather whatever you do, maintain a sense of being on the same side, maintain that sense of agreement with the people with whom you interact. Yes, with brothers, sisters, and more than just the family, brothers and, the, and the sisters in the broader sense, because it's actually a good thing. So don't get caught in a situation where you're you know, cursing each other. <laughs> That's one example. Or another example of merely being in disagreement and still being in, in the sense of you know, brother and sister, whatever that may be, it's unhelpful. But instead, maintain that accord among all because it's actually a good and useful thing. Plus prayer, good. 
All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. One thing out. Second thing, St. Clair, the saint whom we celebrate today. So there, you heard about this in the reflection that we sent out this morning. This is St. Clair, as in, you know, also St. Francis, both of them of Assisi. And St. Clair was really a delightful person. I have a, a great deal of affection for St. Clair. I think, I think she's marvelous. And um, her, her style, her conviction of personality, the way in which she was doing things, very similar, of course, to that of St. Francis at the same time. And they had a lot between them that they shared in terms of these are the things that they are thinking or the things that they are doing in very different ways though. Claire was working in the context of a monastery. She was enclosed in that way. There's a rather remarkable story about the time when, this is kind of like the famous St. Clair story, the time when some mercenaries from the town next door, <laughs> this being medieval you know, Italy after all, some mercenaries from the town next door were kind of creeping up to the monastery to take it as a position to then further invade the, the town of Assisi. And uh, she wouldn't have it. So, she, you know, very, very strong prayer to the Lord. Then comes this moment of there's, so she takes this, this monstrance. Um, this is early in the days of Eucharistic adoration. This is not a usual thing at this point. This is very strange. So she takes this monstrance and uh, with the host in it, hosts, I think, plural. I, there are the different versions of the story, but the details don't quite matter that much. Still, she takes it to a place um, kind of at the wall of the convent of the, of, the, of the monastery, which is more like a castle than anything else. I mean, again, think about it. It's medieval Italy. And uh, praise there, light shines. The people who are the mercenaries who are attacking the monastery are blinded. They turn it back and the, the attack is thwarted. It's, it's a great story, uh, not just of St. Clair, but also for Assisi, and uh, obviously it's really about the Blessed Sacrament when it comes down to it. Anyway, that's one interesting story about St. Clair. There are lots of others, and a lovely connection to the story of St. Francis. Now, what I want to talk about, though, the, the weird thing I want to talk about, is this business of the death of Moses that we read in Deuteronomy today. So I got to pick up this book. It's, it's, it's driving me crazy. One second. Okay. All right. I feel better now as opposed to having the book completely messed up on the floor. All right. So we heard in Deuteronomy about the death of Moses. There are a couple interesting details there. So first of all, he dies in a place, but no one can find his tomb. That's interesting. In <laughs> there, it's, it's um, all these places are well known. They're they're not just kind of hidden places. They're not imaginary places. They're around, but what's up with that? I think that's a great question. So, also, just last week we celebrated the Transfiguration. Remember the Transfiguration? There were along with the Lord Moses and Elijah. Now. Elijah, we know what happened to him when he died. And of course, this is sometime later than Moses. Elijah goes up with chariot of fiery wheels and such into heaven. And Elisha is left, you know, seeing this whole thing happen. Remember, that's what happens to Elijah. Okay. And then Moses. Wait, what? So one of the ways in which we can think of the transfiguration is that simply Moses is there in like soul, but not body. But that's not really the that that's not really the sense we get from the transfiguration story or from the history of what happened to Moses. So this account in Deuteronomy 34 that we read about the death of Moses is interesting and it's also worth like there's more to the story than merely this. So there's a little tiny book of scripture at the end of the Bible it's the penultimate book of the Bible, the letter of Jude. It is one chapter long, one of those very, very short ones. It's right before we get to the book of Revelation. And it's interesting. So there's a section in here 
about bad teachers. This is, it. this is verse five. Although you already know all this, allow me to remind you that the Lord who once delivered the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who refused to believe. Remember also that the angels who were dissatisfied with the dominion that had been assigned to them and abandoned their proper dwelling place had been kept bound by him in darkness with eternal chains until the judgment of the great day. And also angels and demons, apparently. Okay. Verse 8 and 9 of the one chapter of the letter of Jude. In the same way, these dreamers, that's in a bad sense, defile their bodies, make light of authority, and insult celestial beings. Even the archangel Michael, when he engaged in an argument with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but instead said, may the Lord rebuke you. And that little mention of the body of Moses is in the con is just right there. And it's like, <laughs> the author of this letter is writing this as if everyone knew that Michael and Satan apparently had a battle over the body of Moses. That's interesting. This is probably not something that you often think about or maybe have even heard about before. <coughs> so, there's another history, <clears throat> which from time to time we talk about the apocryphal weird stuff. And precisely about the death of Moses, there is a strange pseudo epigraphical work, meaning it has someone's name in, in the title, but it doesn't actually mean that it's about them. In this case, Moses, called The Assumption of Moses, that details the weird secret stuff that Moses was telling Joshua before Moses died. This interesting work, it's not very long, was uh, known to people in the ancient world, probably known to the author of the letter of Jude. Probably, that was probably what he was referring to. Um, also other of like the church fathers, like Clement of Alexandria. They, they knew about this little tiny thing, this weird work. And it was lost and found recently in the middle of the 19th century in a library in Milan. And it's missing a lot of pages, like a dozen or so pages, especially at the end where Moses is going like really poet, really, like really poetic. And the, the content of this work is kind of spooky and weird. And it's by no means like anywhere near being like scripture of any kind, not even like weird apocryphal scripture. No, no, not that. This is, this is just an interesting text, but it's called the assumption of Moses for a reason, because when it talks about Moses dying, it says instead Moses rising. And <laughs> hence also a, another tradition in there that, well, Moses dies, is buried, or something like it, and then goes up to heaven somehow, kind of quickly. Hence, the children of Israel not knowing the exact location of his tomb. All right, so it gets pretty, it gets pretty wild. Like, like what, what, what is this kind of story? What is all of this? It's, it's just kind of weird. And it has, it has, you know, the, the, the excitement of a lost and found book. And that's what this is. We lost it, we found it. Some of it is still lost. And who knows really what its origin is. It wasn't written by Joshua. I mean, not any copy that we have. But then again, the scripture is kind of strange anyway. After all, the Torah, these first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, um, Traditionally, we say, traditionally, people say, is written by, by Moses. Well, if Moses dies in Deuteronomy, that still leaves, you know, Numbers and Leviticus, and who wrote those? Well, Joshua is, is the next answer. And of course, then the next answer is, yeah, a group of people wrote them, and it came a little bit later, and other things like that. But generally, the composition of these things, at least in, like, making sure that the, there is a story in there, is whatever that history is, usually based around, comes back to Moses. 
yeah, it's all a little bit complicated. So <clears throat> it's, I think worth noting that funny little kind of complicated histories like this are interesting, or at least they're interesting to me. And maybe you find it interesting and exciting too, because it's like, there's a movie involved here and it has like a really good soundtrack. It's a it's, it's tense and suspenseful soundtrack. And there's like the finding of lost books involved and you know, this incredible different story about the death of Moses and what is really true, oh my goodness. And then finally we get to the transfiguration and Moses is there. It is, how did that happen? Okay, you get, you get the idea. There's a lot of, you know, we, we can make this into a much larger story than it is. And of course, yes, there are different writings and different traditions and different ways of explaining these things all kind of wrapped up in one. But of course, does it really matter? No, not that much. Um, I think it's worthwhile though, to use this as a, as a jumping off point for an important kind of reflection that we never ever make. We're very used to having these parallels drawn between Moses and Jesus. So we heard in, in this reading from Deuteronomy, Moses's epitaph. There's never been a prophet in Israel who was so great as Moses who spoke with the Lord face to face. Well, you know, if we're reading that, we should immediately think of Jesus Christ, God himself, you know, and, and kind of that's the conclusion of this. Cool, interesting. And of course, like from slavery to freedom, saves the people, all of these things are kind of Moses, Jesus parallels. From the slavery of sin to the freedom of something else, of being the children of God. That sounds like a great kind of Moses, Jesus parallel. Well, I think that we should also, from time to time, make a different parallel, the Moses Mary parallel, which might even be sometimes a little bit more sens sensible. So Moses also is the one who you know, speaks with God. God is not Moses. And this happens in a variety of ways from the burning bush to the, on the mountain, to the tent, the tabernacle that is set up and so on. And Mary has a very similar experience with Gabriel, the Holy Spirit, that kind of moment there at the Annunciation, then uh, Jesus in her womb, Jesus born, Jesus the child, Jesus the older child, Jesus the man in his ministry, and finally the crucifixion, and so on, and after the resurrection. These are stages, not just in Mary's life, but also, well, frankly, in the life of Jesus. And so there's a progression here, not unlike the progression that Moses has with God, and kind of like coming to a closer and closer understanding of him. The burning bush versus God in the meeting tent are kind of different presentations of God talking to Moses. They're very different. They have different consequences. Also, Moses is the one who builds the tabernacle. Mary is a living tabernacle. That's one of the ways of talking about her in the incarnation. And interestingly, the assumption. <laughs> so this is kind of one of those, maybe it's, it's like e even more groovy and weird than we expect, but this assumption of Moses business, which is not doctrine, this is not the dogma of our faith, it's just a weird document from the ancient world, which was lost for a long time, which we found some of in a library, you know, a little while ago. This is all kind of nonsense, but it does have a nice kind of resonance and sets the stage for the, you know, the real dogma and doctrine and the real kind of understanding of the assumption of Mary. That there's an, that there's a relationship here. And, you know, historically kind of making this connection between Moses and Mary is one of those things that no one does because Moses is Moses and Mary is Mary. You know, it's, it's kind of, they, they have different things that there's going on and clearly the relationship is Moses to Jesus. That's clearly what's going on. But we can, we can if we're gonna, you know, bring into 
our minds things like you know the assumption of moses that weird little document that was known to people in the ancient world and is just weird um then why not also allow ourselves a different kind of reflection on scripture now here we're coming back into very safe waters because one of the things that we should always do honestly is see scripture and the grace of god and the gifts that we have received and so on in the light of mary which is why marian devotion is such an important thing for catholics why we pray the rosary why mary is a big deal it's not just because we say so but because this is also part of that practice of faith which is very useful for us we can see things through mary in a different light and one that is much more helpful than you know the ridiculous kind of plot twists that we find in finding old books about kind of boring subjects so in reading for example this part in deuteronomy about the death of moses through a marian light we have a couple things that come immediately to the surface of how much we should give thanks to god so thankfulness is a very important one uh, for Moses and his ministry, Moses and the law, Moses and prophecy, Moses and all the rest of those things, Moses and leading the children of Israel through the desert, through this time of you know, actually coming to know the Lord more and more, and so on. And also the way in which Moses models several good qualities for us. This thankfulness, why is thankfulness a Marian kind of way of reading scripture? Well, because this is the way that she reads scripture. So <clears throat> she is the one who keeps all these things in her heart, so says the Gospel of Luke, in a way that is, we assume, a manner of giving thanks to God for them. And earlier in Luke, when Mary makes her big magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, which is to say, my soul is grateful to the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has done these good things to me and all generations will call me blessed the uh, way that mary sees herself in this long and interesting history um, is one of giving thanks to god and when we also read scripture and our lives and race in general and you know the things that are of god in this light of thanksgiving then i think we also have a very useful and very realistic kind of spiritual underpinning for the rest of our living and also thinking about strange and interesting things like lost books and um anyway should one by the way one kind of weird thing that you find in the in the uh, assumption of moses text is uh there's a a prophecy for when the messiah will come <laughs> which of course is correct <laughs> anyway um so <laughs> you get you, you get the idea like some of these things are weird uh some of these things are kind of like really extra groovy but um the important thing i think here is especially in these these days leading up to the assumption we actually should you know set our minds in a way that is actually of mary and when we think of that also we think that you know things like the like the 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 annunciation gabriel showing up and talking to mary for a bit or like when the magi show up and bringing their gifts these were weird events do you think that she was like okay this is totally normal all of this is totally great no um i'm sure she was a little bit this is strange and in fact she does express fear at the annunciation but there's also a great deal of trust and thanksgiving in it. When we encounter strange events like this, like for example, apocryphal books, then um, it's, it's, it's sensational. It's meant to be almost something that just makes us confused or whatever. Not so in a Marian way of seeing the world, where yes, there are many things that we do not understand, but everything is truly in God's hands and for the good, actually. And um, it's not necessarily entirely of us to try to figure out the weird extra story behind it. Anyway, I've, I've been wanting to 
share this one for a while. It's a kind of a complicated subject, and I hope you found it a little bit edifying and maybe learned something you didn't know about. Not that it's actually like really learning anything, but there's all kinds of weird stuff out there, and it's kind of fun, I think, and I hope you enjoy that. Anyway, as we always do, let's bring our prayers together now and offer them to the Lord that he will hear and answer us. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop Oscar, and for all bishops, that they find aid from the Holy Spirit in guiding flocks to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Catholic Church, that she be the light of the world to all who seek truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For God's people throughout the world, that we find encouragement and grace in our effort to conform ourselves to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our parish, that as we commemorate the Immaculate Heart of Mary this month, we grow closer to loving Christ as she does. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, that they be greeted by Jesus most merciful. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For whom or what else shall we pray? From Linda, for a successful eye surgery this morning for Thatcher Miller, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. From Larry, for the sale of Larry and Suzanne's home in Heber and their move to California, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. From Priscilla, for the Beeler family and that Selena has a safe and peaceful birth, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who in your mercy led St. Clair to a love of poverty, grant through her intercession that following Christ in poverty of spirit, we may merit to contemplate you one day in the heavenly kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Great. Thanks for letting me talk about something weird and with lots of connections today. Whew. There are lots of different ways we could put that together too, honestly, but it's, I hope you enjoy that. Let's keep praying. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down in mercy on your people who cry to you. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of St. Joseph, her spouse, of your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, in mercy and goodness, hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother and Church. For the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Fantastic. Hey, Larry, sorry to hear that you're leaving. It's been great having you. Well, you know, we'll talk more about that. And yes, very good luck in the days to head. All right, God bless you all. Thank you all. Be well, enjoy Wednesday. We'll come back together on Saturday. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.